President Baker. All right. Hands up. White. President. Jones. Here. Brown. Here. Bobbitt. Here. Says. Here. <laughs> Here are proxies. Wow. Uh, Martel? McMurtry? Duncan? Senators? Baker? Here. Uh, Wilbright? Hansen? Weiss? Jones? Here. Brown? Here. Lovett? Here. Said? Here. Martel? Here. Mary Tree, here. Duncan, here. Treasurer, here. Secretary, here. EVP, yeah. IVP, yeah. President. So we've brought in our own experiences to really form a good idea of what an excellent teacher is and how we can bring that to rice. Um, and we've also done benchmarking, looking at other institutions and their digital education and online education presence and how that can affect what we do here. And then we've met with key players such as the Associate Dean of Undergraduate Dean Matthew Taylor and <coughs> the Director of the Center for Teaching Excellence, Dr. Eiler, both of whom are ex officio members of our working group. And then we've also met with the Vice Provost, Dr. Lavander, the Provost, George McClendon, and the Director of Rice Online, um, whose name is no longer up there. Cyret. Sorry? Cyret. Cyret. It was up there, I promise. 
Uh, so the current structure of our working group is divided into three key areas. Teaching excellence, so as I mentioned before, getting information about what makes a teacher really special and how can we encourage all teachers to kind of take on those best practices. The internal use of digital education, so how we can use our online education endeavors to improve teaching here at Rice for Rice students. And then finally, the external use of digital education. So how is Rice going to have an, a national and an international presence on the web as a great provider of online education through MOOCs, massive open online courses? And next slide. Okay, so just talking about our next steps. So as my co-author mentioned, we've done a lot, but there's still a lot to do. So one thing, we want to start meeting with professors who are already working towards creating MOOCs. So professors like Professor Rixner, who's working with Coursera and things like that, just to get their opinions and their thoughts on how Rice should start working externally with our brand, basically. How are we gonna present MOOCs to the world? Um, other things, we wanna start gathering student feedback. But before we even start gathering student feedback, we want our working groups to have a really good understanding of what kind of questions we want to ask because we don't wanna just like throw a bunch of questions out your way and not really have good organization. So that'll take a couple weeks, then there will be weeks of feedback. Um, uh, more key things, the legislation will be introduced in January. That's gonna have recommendations and requests and a request for the president to respond to our recommendations and then we'll get on the forum in the spring with an administrator. So with that, does anyone have any questions? You did a good job, I guess. No questions. Thank you very much.
up and it's like an amendment to the bill, we can motion. So we got a second. So can we do roll call vote? First, are there any objections to not um, having a prior notice on this? So academics projects are kind of split up into two groups, and I'll be talking about the immediate action projects that we're looking to get done in a shorter time frame. Um, so last year, the registration system was changed, and one of our big projects is monitoring how that change affected people and seeing if there's anything we can do uh, to improve registration right now. Um, also, we're working on the student creation of new language classes that Rice currently doesn't offer, and we'll be talking about that a little bit later in the presentation as well. Um, we're working on a petroleum engineering concentration for the Chubby major. And we're also working on restructuring the policy studies major, which we'll also be talking about a little bit later. Some long-term projects <laughs> that we hope to accomplish in the future include modeling a Northeastern Life Co-op internship program. And so for those of you who don't know it, it would be an internship requirement before graduation for specific majors so that students can gain real-world experiences and become more competitive in the job market. Um, we also wish to create um, a psychology, English, history, and foreign language minor um, a business major and also hire more professors in the future. Since 2004, our student enrollment has increased while our professors have stayed the same, which has led to a lot of registration conflicts, uh, larger class sizes, um, as well as um, sometimes student denial into courses. Okay, so um, one of the short-term projects we mentioned on the last slide was the student creation of language classes. Um, and this kind of came about because looking at Rice's peer institutions, so Rice offers 12 languages right now, and looking at Rice's peer institutions, um, many of them offer double, even triple, I don't know. And also, uh, a lot of them have programs where if there's enough student interest in languages that aren't currently offered, then they can petition the language department of that school to create classes in that language. So just some examples, uh, Stanford has a special language program where if enough students get together and petition the program and they have enough funding, they'll actually hire new professors to teach that language to the students that demonstrate interest. Then kind of a step down from that, um, at Brown, uh, if there is student interest in a language that's not taught, but a faculty or graduate student has experience that, or is fluent in that language, then the students can petition the faculty member or graduate student, R.A. Brown, to uh, start, to work with the language department and make new curriculum for that language. 
And then at Columbia, they have a language resource center which, which uh, helps professors or graduate students start courses in languages that aren't commonly taught. Um, so we're kind of playing with this idea of how we might uh, be able to work at Rice. Um, some of the ideas that have been thrown around are hiring adjunct lecturers or more professors if their students demonstrate interest, kind of like they did at Stanford. Or also basically mirroring Brownsing, if there's a current faculty member that is fluent in the language or graduate student, then they can work with students to create these classes. Um, and one thing that Rice has done in the past actually is have college courses in languages taught by students. Um, so if nothing else, then maybe just work with the Center for Studying Languages to formalize those and hold them to a higher standard. Um, so right now in this project, we're kind of gauging feasibility, gauging feasibility. We're trying to see if there's enough student interest um, if we want to actually pursue something like this. And I actually met with the Center for the Study of Foreign Languages today, and they support um, hiring more professors, uh, kind of like what Stanford does. So I guess the next step would be uh, to send out a survey and gauge like, student interest in the entire population and see if there's nothing that might be worth doing. And then with regards to reconstructing the policy studies major, just a little bit of background on this. This is a very beneficial adjunct second major. Um, it can provide students with practical real world experience um, and knowledge on their field of study. Um, some features of incorporating this as a second major and making it more accessible include um, learning the basics of policy study, applying that knowledge to your specific area of study, and then um, testing your abilities outside of the classroom. And currently the degree requirement are 11 courses, four of which are from the basic curriculum, six of which are from an area of study, and then one internship capstone requirement. And so currently the problem is, is that there are very few um, specifically designated policy studies courses available besides and outside of the um, basic uh, curriculum. And so that leads for much competition with it when it comes to enrolling in these courses. Um, and so classes fill up very quickly, and oftentimes on an individual basis, students have to go and find a course and ask um, a policy studies advisor if this will meet the requirement. And so what we hope to do is standardize this and create one larger list of policy studies courses um, and making it more accessible because this is a very inclusive, important um, major. Um, and then. And then some solutions that we have are to survey the student body to see um, currently what courses are most desirable, as well as what courses um, should be approved in the policy studies major, and then ultimately formally approving um, currently non-designated policy studies courses as policy studies major or courses. So, do you right. have yeah. so those are projects we've been working on too. We really appreciate any questions or comments that you have. Yeah, yeah just they have had it. Yeah, so the college courses taught by students have been in like Vietnamese and Cantonese, I think. Yeah. And so we're at, we're looking for a more official way, like to actually hire a professor and teach this language for <coughs> more than one semester, okay. ideally. Uh, anything else? Yeah. Yeah. I have an option that um, if you don't have any luck with that, something you could pursue is still college classes, but not student taught. So there's a distinction between college classes that are student taught, so they're all pass fail. If they're not student taught, that can be an associate or Designating policy studies um, for policy studies courses. So not creating more, but seeing what ones students are currently using um, and making them more accessible. Sanders 
sat down with the department and said that they were going to uh, close the graduate program, but nothing has been like written down, it's all been spoken, so it's not, I talk, after talking with Eugen and she talked with the GSA president, nothing is set in stone yet, if that's correct. Um, but there's a little bit of a he said, she said, and we won't go into that tonight, but um, I was just curious if you were all at all concerned about how uh, closing a graduate department could affect the undergraduate program. Uh, so that's mainly what we wanted to focus on tonight. So does anyone have any concerns about that? I mean, they may, not, they may not leave necessarily, but I think uh, definitely a problem could be attracting world-class faculty um, at a research institution if we don't have a graduate program. Uh, but yeah, but I guess they could, but I guess the more cause for concern would be attracting more world-class faculty. Yeah, Brian? From my understanding, uh, the presence of graduate students, especially in a program like this, is helpful for, for undergrads. Um, you know, whether that's as TAs or as other people in the field that they can work with mm -hmm. and potentially get advice from who aren't necessarily faculty members. Um, and I think that was one of the things that was also mentioned in the external review, which was that was a big asset to this program in particular. So it's just a general. Diversifying interest, research, and mentorship kind of thing. Anyone else?
try to figure out students who teach intro level linguistics courses, which allow faculty to teach more upper level and like more like more technical courses within the major, which I thought I'm not a linguistics major, but I thought was cool. And it was a new like a different side that we don't really get in a lot of other disciplines. For sure. And then I'm sure TA is still a different level yeah. courses in terms of the writing. Do you think it's a valid concern that it would be hard to recruit world class faculty like without a graduate program?
I thought, hey, why don't we get a student group? And Mitch helped formulate some of these things, and we've run them by uh, Nathan, and they're still being formulated. So you still have an opportunity, officers of SA, um, to input how this looks. But basically, the short story will be eight to 10 students from around campus representing different um, needs to um, really have a working group meet monthly, collaborate on things that are needed um, as we progress. So what are the things sort of on the horizon which you may um, have tremendous input in on? First slide. <laughs> All right, so the first thing that's kind of happening is you know that we've renovated a lot of the study rooms on the second floor of Fondren Library, the nice furniture tag. There still are a huge amount of study rooms that haven't been renovated and we have money to do so, and we have money to do so now. Um, so as you're um, in study rooms, it's very important for you to help me with this survey. I have a lighting rep coming in tomorrow, um, and we're really making these decisions now. So if there are things you want, um, soundproofing of rooms, specifics on lighting, anything that you need, we have a nice sum of money, and these changes are being made. Next slide, please. Um, Another thing, we recently had last spring the LibQual survey, which got a lot of information uh, from students. And one thing that we always hear is there's not enough chairs to sit in, there's not enough space. So Fondren Library has always been very generous to the local surrounding community, especially the medical center on weekends. So what we're doing is a little bit different. And this year we're gonna be closed for the first two weeks um, sometimes entirely to outside users, and other times very restricted hours. What this means is we'll be able to do some special events for you guys, um, coffee at 10 to midnight and some other special things, but I also need your help. Make sure you have your ID when you come, and there will be times that only um, the pavilion side entrance will be open to you. My apologies, I am a Jones associate, um, and I understand you gotta walk around. But that's the only way that we can really make sure. We're also renting some extra tables and chairs. We're also turning Kalmora Room into a study hall. So those things we are doing. But uh, next slide, please. So this will you'll start to see this more, but I just wanted to give you guys a heads up because I will be here. But this is the type of thing where a student uh, library ambassador program is actually really fundamentally crucial. Now on this project, I was lucky enough to be able to get Mitch's input and we had some other student workers give input. But I would love to have the standing group that could travel with us on these plans. Next slide. So um, we will be doing, um, actually this is the study room survey, what that looks like. The first slide was actually for the December closing hours. So if you will pop up the website. So in line with this um, student ambassador program, um, we would like for you to submit a letter of intent, which is currently on um, a website for uh, the UX office, which is libguides.rise.ux, and you can submit the Google form. It's gonna come up in just a second, I'm absolutely certain of it, unless we get another Skype in. <laughs> <laughs> Libguides.rice.edu, many of you probably use these for library content and to help you find resources on different topics, I'm sure. Um, so as you scroll down here, these are sort of some of the main um, goals of, um, of this student group. I'm really wanting to make it sustainable. Our changes are going to last for three to five years. Currently, right now, uh, facilities and engineering, as well as an outside uh, architecture architecture firm from Boston, uh, which is one of the best doing libraries in the world right now, um, are here working, uh, doing sort of a planning document. That document will become available in January with priorities that they've selected. And we want those to mesh with your priorities and your needs. And if you're not out there and having a, a strong voice, it may not happen. You may go the way of linguistics <laughs> for the library and other plans there. It's, it's, that was really inappropriate. I'm sorry. It's, Brittany is my dear friend, so it's just, it makes me so mad when people.
people down through participatory design and don't get student feedback. And it, it makes me want to cry that we didn't do that, and I apologize. I'm, I shouldn't be up this late. <laughs> I've been up since four. It's, I'm, I'm angry at that. And I'm, I'm, I don't want the library to do things where we haven't gotten a lot of input. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, and I want to make sure that we do. So I apologize. So that is that. Is that. Um, Mitch, do you have anything that you want to add? Um, into the library. And that's kind of one of those deals too right now where, where the architects are saying it needs to go in a certain place and it needs to be certain services and things like that. And, and I'm, I, I don't necessarily agree with that and so I want to make sure that we do get student feedback on that, where that goes and what that looks like. So, um, I just, I hope that you'll take this opportunity to formulate and have a voice. And, and I'm, I'm working hard for that. Thank you. So basically with um, Beer Bike this year, um, everyone loves Beer Bike, everyone loves the experience of it. It's like waking up on Christmas, it's the biggest holiday at Rice, it's biggest alumni event, and part of our focus with this is that we want to make the track experience one that everyone on campus wants to go to. Um, I know that in years past, like we've had, the, like I know at my college, Baker, like we've had a lot of issues. We've had a lot of issues with uh, people coming in to the balloon fight, like everyone's having fun and they're like, oh, it's such a long walk to the track. I don't know. Ah. No, we want, we want to make the track experience the best that it can be so that everyone wants to go. And that's through food, that's through events at the track, all that kind of fun stuff. But in order to do that, we need y'all's help. Um, we have several area coordinators positions that we need to have filled um, in order to assist us and uh, help us not be running around and tearing our hair out all day. I mean, we'll be doing that anyway. But. <laughs> but yeah, so we just, uh, we have uh, six areas that we need uh, people with uh, experience or no experience. Basically, you just need to have passion for ice, uh, passion for service, and like just an excitement to lead and do something for the university. Uh, so we're based, so, so I'm gonna talk about three of the areas. The first one is security. So there's a lot of security volunteers that work both at the track and at the parade and throughout Beer Bike. So the security area coordinator will be in charge of that and setting up trainings, uh, learning exactly <coughs> what being a security volunteer means and then communicating it to everyone and organizing that. The second one, we need two track coordinators. Uh, at least one of these people needs to be able to know how to bike well because they will set up a certification process uh, that every year happens for anyone who wants to actually participate in the beer bike race. And also they will coordinate uh, track times so that certain colleges don't take up every time from like four to six every day. Uh, that happened in the past. Um, and then we also need a timing coordinator. Uh, and this is preferably someone with an engineering background. So last year, a senior design team actually set up as their, as their project a timing, uh, timing device for beer bike, and it's automatic, and we just need someone to, who's tech savvy to be able to set that up uh, and take it back down. Yeah, uh, all right, so we have uh, three more uh, area coordinator positions. First off, concessions, food, everyone loves food. We've gotta have someone who's work, willing to work with area businesses to help bring that food in. Previous years, we've had Chick-fil-A come in. 
we've had uh, Papa John's, other food like that. Like this person's gonna be in charge of a big budget, make sure everyone who um, is coming to the track is gonna get fed and who's happy. Uh, second, we've got uh, the parade coordinators uh, in charge of the water balloon fight and the movement, movement of people towards the track. I mean, y'all know how much fun the water balloon fight is. Sorry, Anastasia, y'all don't know yet, but you will. Um, it's a great experience, and um, like that, that, and then the last, uh, the last area coordinator we need is a uh, judge coordinator. So, in order to run the race, we need to have judges to make sure the race is run fairly. And so, this person is going to be um, soliciting uh, judges from the community, faculty, RAs, um, all that, all those groups, and um, helping to train them and get them ready for the race. So keep an eye out because the applications are coming out this Wednesday. There'll be an ad in the Thresher. We're going to post it on Facebook. Uh, and then we'll come out this Wednesday. And if you do next Wednesday, it's just three short questions. And then we'll interview the week after that. Where will all the information be online? The information will be on the RPC website starting on Wednesday. So the RPC website? Yeah, front page. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions about area coordinators, beer bike in general, anything y'all want to see? Anything you want to see change from last year? should be easy now with the timing system. It's like much easier. And so I think last year they got a few kinks out of the system as sort of the end of their senior design project. So <coughs> anything else? All right, thanks you guys. I think it's like 150 days until beer bike. So. <laughs>
And then also for senators, who haven't picked up since he was posted yet, please do so. And uh, drum step is this weekend, 10 p.m. Saturday night to 2 a.m. Sunday morning. It's a ton of fun. <laughs> also, NSRs, uh, we will be having our first NSR dinner this Thursday at 6 p.m. at Hanson Commons. Yeah.